Good morning. Christ is risen. The gospel for the third Sunday in Easter is always one where the risen Christ shares food with the disciples. Meals that are an Easter template that meant for meal for each Monday, each meal we share each Sunday. In today's gospel, Jesus both shares with the disciples food and shows them the meaning of his suffering, death, and resurrection through the scriptures. The two main elements of our Sunday worship. Please stand for the opening hymn, One Bread, One Body. Psalm 4, I will read the odd verses and we all will read the even verses. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You have set me free when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you have illusions and seek after lies? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful, the Lord will hear me be when I call. Tremble then, and do not sin. Speak your heart in the silence of your, your head. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Many are saying, Who will show us good and good? The light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine ab abound. In peace, peace I will lie down to sleep, for you will know, O oh Lord, make me rest in Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, and our Easter and our joy. Amen. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water. 
Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for the fear, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian officials entered your boundless baptismal life. Look, here is water. Here is the water of life. Hallelujah. At the River Jordan, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you opened the floodgate of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you through the risen Christ, our source of living water. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is the water of my Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. Help save Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Please be seated. So do you know why we do the Kyrie? Why? Because we're waiting for you. That's right. Because pastors used to move from house church to house church, and so they sang hymns until he got there. And that's the Kyrie. Okay. The first reading today is from Acts 3, uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. After healing a man unable to walk, Peter pre preaches to the people, describing how God's promise to Israel has been fulfilled in Jesus. Through the proclamation of Christ's death and resurrection, God is offering them forgiveness and restoration in Jesus' name. Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom he handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are all witnesses. And by faith in this his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord, the word of life. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Holy and righteous God, you are the author, author of life. Uh, today of our Lord's resurrection, by the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of resurrection in all of us and in the new, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns in you and the Holy Spirit, one God.
The second reading today is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. God has loved us in order to make us children of God. Though we do not yet know the full details of our future existence, we trust that God will reveal it just as God revealed Jesus to take away our sins. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he is revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteousness. The word of the Lord, the word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Gospel is from Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning at the 36th verse. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do, you, why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they were in their joy, and he had said this to them, oh, while they were in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. Easter is a time for kind of getting over our fears and seeking new direction. The problem is that like the disciples, we often find ourselves in places where the events of our lives lead us to feel lost and insecure. The disciples are still locked up in an upper room. Face it, there's nothing new in this. This is part of our experience. Paul said, we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke as a child and I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. 
Now we know only in part, and then we will know fully, even as we have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Now we see in a glass darkly. So I think I can say with every confidence that we don't get it. <laughs> and I think that that's an important piece to the scripture today. This scripture is much, much more important than you might think. First of all, as an avid fisherman, it gives me hope for heaven. If there's fish to eat, there's fish to be caught. Amen. Or as Pharaoh would say, so let it be written, so let it be done. And, you know, that really is important, much more important than you know. So what do we really know for a fact? Well, running to 1 John, that little piece that we read second, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. And the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been fully revealed. We do know this. When he's revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Okay. There's a couple of things in there that are really important. First of all, we don't play enough. If you're a child, that's your business, isn't it? Playing is good. Having fun is good. Eating the ears off of a chocolate Easter bunny is a necessity. <laughs> if you don't, you've missed something whether it's milk chocolate or dark chocolate. Either one will work. And if you're allergic to chocolate, there's peeps. other things. Oh, and peeps are not part of creation. <laughs> no, no. But they do make a wonderful lava flow if you throw the whole bag into a fire. I mean, you know, come on. OK, you see what I mean? So. One of the things that we really are careful about with children is that we don't leave them alone too much. Children should not be left alone. And the other thing about being a child is that there's this sense of wonder. I mean, when is the first time you ever saw a Jerusalem cricket and went, ooh? I mean, they're kind of weird bugs. It doesn't even really look like a cricket, but they're cool. I saw one about that long when I was in Yellowstone one time, and it was black. Never seen a black one before. So you just kind of watch that. And then, you know, that was the same hike that I saw all of these little pine trees about this big growing out of the cracks of the rocks. Life struggles. And it, Life overcomes. We grow up much too quickly because we stop looking around for that which is good. So we are the children of God now. What we're going to be, we have no idea. And we don't need to worry about it. Right? Because that's one of the other things about children. I mean, you know, it's like, what will happen if you wrap a hundred match heads and put them in a pipe and then heat it up? I didn't worry about it. Cool, it went boom. 
I was very fortunate though because I didn't put enough in there to split the pipe. That's because I was, on the other hand, I did take a skyrocket and fill it with powder from, and wrapped it with string and then lacquered it and wrapped it with string and then lacquered it and then buried it in the pitcher man, pitcher's mound of the high school. And I had about an eight foot fuse on it. That's a long fuse, right? Not long enough. And as I was jumping over the edge of the ditch, it went off and I got just splattered with dirt. But the pitcher's mound was not there. <laughs> it was really cool. I was a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> On the other hand, I had a good time. So those were part of my voyage of discovery. I've learned a lot about things. And I'm not near as adventurous as my son was when he found the can of black powder in my garage. I mean, you know, it's like, that stuff is bad. <laughs> and it's pretty primitive compared to a lot of other things. So just, you know, kind of live life in an exploratory way and try not to blow your hand off. <laughs> so I said this was a really important scripture and the, one of the reasons is, is because it says that we know only in part and we will know fully. It says that we are the children of God now, but what we are going to be is not yet revealed, okay? But then we as people, we like to know and we like to be right about what we know. So we have invented all sorts of ways of thinking about Jesus. One of them is actually taken care of in this scripture. Jesus stood among the disciples and said to them, peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, what's wrong with you? Why are you sitting there with your mouths open? Oh, that's not what it says, but it, it's close enough. And then he shows them his hands and his feet and says, touch me. A ghost does not have flesh. How many of you are sure that when you die, you'll become a spirit and rise up? That's Greek. Rise up, yes. Become a spirit, no. This is bodily resurrection. And you get to have fish and fried chicken and a nice piece of steak. Or if you're of other types of things, you know, it's like a nice piece of broccoli. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, there are people of all sorts. And, you know, so he shows them his hands and feet. And while they were still wondering and disbelieving, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish and he ate it. Now, why in the heck is that so important? Well, actually, it's because there was an early Christian heresy called docetism from the Greek dokus, which means a simile or a, something that seems to be or a seeming thing. And the docetists believe that Jesus never really did take on flesh. And because of that, he didn't really have to suffer on the cross because Jesus was always a spirit and never a human being. And so he, what, he didn't suffer, he didn't die. And it just is a perfect way of taking the whole Greek thought of the separation of flesh and spirit and making it into the Christian reality. And that same Greek thought really still exists today. Do I know what's going to happen when I die? I haven't the foggiest idea. But it seems that scripture, Christian scripture, 
tells us that we will be raised bodily. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And I cannot even begin to imagine that. But scripture also teaches about the soul and that the soul separate. You know, so in scripture, there is that Greek thought. It's in the New Testament, as well as the bodily resurrection. And so new pastor gets invited to the women's Bible study. What does he do? He teaches about bodily resurrection. And one of the women who was recently widowed looked at me and said, I don't care what you think. My husband is in heaven now, and he is a spirit. You know something? She's right. Why? First of all, because you do not argue with you, Layla. <laughs> you won't win. Even if you're right, you won't win. And second of all, both thoughts are in scripture. And she was running to John, you know, to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. I have other ways of dealing with that, but that's because I believe in the time-space continuum, which Eulalia had never really thought about. And it's like, I don't believe in time. Not really. And that way I can be with Jesus and you know, it gets very confusing, but that's okay because I have fun with it. And I recognize the fact that I'm a child of God now. And that basically almost all of my theological thoughts are play. And that I do not know. That really irritates the heck out of some people because they want me to tell them the truth. And I'll be real honest with you, I haven't the foggiest idea. But I do know about fish because it's important to me. We had fried fish the other night. Nancy has got that down. Boy, it was good. And I don't want to miss that in heaven. So a lot of the things that I believe about heaven are the things that I want to believe. Like an eight foot fuse is long enough. <laughs> Boy, they burn quick. <laughs> okay. And it, mostly it's because I was taking all the fuses out of the lady fingers and just kind of twisting them together. That does not work. So here's Jesus. And why is he there with the, with, with the disciples? Well, you know, we had basically a very similar scripture last week. And Bob said it very plainly. He said, because it makes the disciples feel good. He didn't say it in quite that way. He's much more eloquent than I am. And, you know, the, the truth of it is, is that, yeah, Jesus is trying to reassure the disciples. And so that's one of the things that's really important about this scripture this morning, is you need to be reassured. You need to know just like a child knows that they're safe, that you're safe. And when Jesus comes and he shows them the scars in his hands and his feet and his side, the, and then he says, do you have any fish? Well, he didn't say it that way. He said, do you have anything to eat? Chicken would have done. You know, it's like ham, probably not. Jesus was a good Jew. But, you know, it's one of those kinds of things that we don't think about as Christians. And I think that it's important. First of all, don't go the way of the Greeks. Why is that bad? Well, there's two Greeks, you know, you've got the aesthetics and you've got the Stoics, right? Well, the Stoics are grumps. I mean, basically, they just suffer through life. And the Epicureans, who are a kind of aesthetic, you know, they, they enjoy life. They love good food. 
And in fact, they might even eat too much of it at a time, you know. It's like one of the things that probably will be in heaven is Cherry's Garcia ice cream. <laughs> now, I know that it wasn't there in the first century, but it's good. But I, you don't believe in time, so that doesn't matter. That's right. It always has been there. <coughs> and do the math on time. If you take away probability, if you take away the uncertainty and the probability part of that equation, you can, the arrow of time goes both ways. Oh, yes. You know, so it's like, there's good reason for me to believe my folly. I have no question. <laughs> I don't know. So now let's get into this, okay? Jesus said, here are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me, the prophets, has to be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand scripture. That means Bible study is important. But it also means that suffering and dying and rising again on the third day was important. You see why this is important when you're talking about the Greek docetists? It's like this is saying, Jesus did not go through all of that for nothing. Jesus went through all of that for us. And then he says that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. This is the kicker. You are the witnesses of these things. Mm. You've heard that same passage in, said in different ways. You know, the last part of Matthew, go you into all the world, you know, preaching, spreading the gospel, baptizing in my name. The, the key word is go. The key word is beginning, beginning from Jerusalem, which is another way of saying go. Now, the resurrection is kind of a big stretch for most people, which is why it's most likely true. I mean, you know, anything that, that just kind of boggles the mind, yeah, okay, don't, don't just discount it. Because you see, it's God who sets boundaries or destroys boundaries, actually. But we like to set boundaries, and we put God in a box. God wouldn't do that, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that your box is too small, and that we're sitting in that box today. This church is that kind of a box. And one of the problems that we have as a, as a church is that we forget the go. We think go means to leave our homes and come here. You go to church. And then you become a welcoming church, right? And if you're a welcoming church, why don't you grow? Because that's not what Jesus has asked us to do. Jesus said to welcome the stranger, yes, but that's not sit and wait for everybody to come to you. So instead of being a welcoming church, if we have any hope, we have to be an inviting church. It's that go part. Tell somebody, hey, you know, my church is pretty cool. Or you should come with us because we're going to have a potluck. Potlucks are amazing things. And if you come for the first time, it's free. You can, you can, you can say, I didn't know. And you can eat as much as you want. That's part of welcoming. But you see, before the welcome was the invite. Did Jesus find a building 
and sit there and wait for people to come? No. Then why do we expect it to work? Now, don't get me wrong, I am the world's worst evangelist. That's why I'm a pastor, so that I won't have to do it. You guys go. I don't want to. Um, on the other hand, how do we balance this thing? How do we balance our point of comfort with go and sit? Sit is welcoming, go is kind of creepy. Because if you say something about your church to somebody or about Jesus to somebody, they could reject you. Nobody ever rejected Jesus. That's why they arrested him. See what I'm saying? We've got this wrong. One of the most influential books that was floating around when I was in seminary was by an author that I actually knew and it was called The Welcoming Congregation or The Welcoming Church. And his whole thing was about welcoming people in. Well, I'm sorry, but Jesus never did that. I mean, he attended wild parties, yes. Which is why the scribes and the Pharisees could say that he's a drunkard and a glutton. Life is out there, not in here. And we make the mistake of thinking that we're doing it the way it's supposed to be done. Well, it worked for Jesus. Why isn't it working for us? Because we forgot the go part. And you are witnesses to this. We forgot the go part. Bring somebody to church next Sunday. I mean, you know, it's the third Sunday. Pastor Bob will be here. Wait till the fourth Sunday and it'll be Margaret or Tiger or somebody. And that's always wild. I mean, you know, you can never tell what they're going to say. Actually, I think both of them are good preachers. And I wouldn't come here if I thought that they were just messing it up. Are we breaking the rules here? What rules? I mean, we're children. We're not responsible for that. <laughs> Bishops are grown-ups. We're not. We don't have to be. We're going to do what works. And here we are, we're a mountain church. What's cool about being a mountain church? Uh, how about snow on the, what is the day? The 14th or 15th of April? 14th. Oh, good. I don't know what day it is. I don't have to anymore. <laughs> this is the point. First of all, we need to have more fun. Okay? Because that's what children do. And... I know things can be scary, but Jesus came to reassure us, and we need to take that reassurance, and we need to take it out. Church is not a scary place. Church should be more fun. I think God likes jokes. My wife doesn't always agree with me because sometimes in the evening when we're praying before a meal, I will tell God a joke. And she thinks that that is sacrilegious. She may be right, but God will forgive me. And if it was a bad joke, God will have to forgive me twice. <laughs> this is what I'm getting about. First of all, you are not alone, and the tomb is empty. If Jesus had wanted to be a recluse, he could have stayed in the tomb, and none of this would have been a problem. And if Jesus had meant to be totally incommunicative, 
he wouldn't have sent the Holy Spirit. Now, Lutherans are weird because we really don't believe in the Holy Spirit in a lot of ways. But I do because I wasn't raised exactly a Lutheran. And when I wrote my master's thesis, my, I wanted to write it on Luther's understanding of the Holy Spirit. And my thesis advisor said, Jim, don't do it. And I said, well, why not? He says, first of all, you're right. Luther said a lot about the Holy Spirit, but he didn't say it using those words. Second of all, if you write about the Holy Spirit, they won't ordain you. You didn't know that, did you? You didn't know that the Lutheran seminaries have an anti-Holy Spirit thing. Not all of them, not my thesis advisor. But when you think about it, how often do we talk about the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is amazing because that means that God is now. We are the children of God now. And our Father talks to us. No, you didn't imagine it. But don't go tell everybody because they'll, you know, they'll, they'll put you away. But the point of it is, is that we have to learn to separate things. We have to learn to separate good from evil, true from false. And not everything that occurs in your head is from God, okay? So, don't talk about it ever, no. You know what I've learned to do as a pastor is if I have something that I really think is a leading of the spirit for the church that I was leading, I used to do nothing. And I would wait for somebody else to come up with the same idea. I would talk about things, but I wouldn't say, I think God is sending us the direction. I would wait for somebody else to come up with that idea, and then I would jump on it. Because that's confirmation. God doesn't talk to one person and say, follow me. God talks to the body of Christ, and that's us. God is still speaking in this place. We are still connected, and the tomb is empty, and in a way, we need to empty this place out and then come back a little more full. But when we come back, we'd better make darn sure that it's good news and we have a good time. Because we only come together to strengthen ourselves, to grow in faith, and not to feel browbeaten. Look, if you want to really feel bad about yourself and unsure and, and frightened, do your taxes. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, how can you know what to do? They change the rules every year and then they will penalize you if you didn't know it changed. Now, that's not fair. The rules don't change here. And the rule number one is you are the children of God now and this is about good news. Amen. Please join me in the hymn of the day. Alleluia, Jesus has risen.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of the good news. O oh God, our Holy One, you feed us through our deepest hungers as we share the most holy meal that those body and the blood that Christ has given for us. Lead us to share all that we have and find gender and generosity, abundant life. God of grace, hear our prayer. O God, our creator, you bring forth all life on earth. Calm the storms, bring the water to parched places, and protect the climate. That is planet would sustain life in all its variety. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of savior, you wisdom, you offer wisdom, guidance, and beyond human knowledge. Instruct lawmakers, judges, elected officials to make decisions grounded in your justice and care for all of your people. God of grace. Hear our prayer. God, our elder, you care for all your children, encouraging those who are in times of transition, facing loss in the old ways and routines and anticipating of change. Guide us in the journey of grief, hope, and uncertainty. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of our center, you bring our people together. You help us remember our identity and our purpose in ministry. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share our beloved community. God of grace, hear our prayer. Here you may enter other prayers either silently or aloud. Hear our prayer. God of grace. Hear our prayer. O oh God, our resting place, your Son, Jesus, promised that we are held in your love forever. We remember all of our beloved who have died, and we remember to sh to share their love and comfort those who mourn. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O most merciful God, we commend all whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love, through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace be with, all, with you. And also with you. We share, now we share the peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Clyde. Is it snowing or is that coming off the trees? Off the trees.
We now give to God what he's forgiven to us. Let us sing the doxology. Please stand. Please join me in the offertory prayer. You call us to believe and bear fruit, that the gifts we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witness in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our divine. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is our to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection gave to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often was, as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You are the beloved of God in Christ Jesus, the children of God. Come, for he is present for you in this bread and in this wine. Love of God.
of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you in his grace now and always. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the prayer after communion. Shepherd in God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share your abundant mercy in Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Amen. Uh, we have some announcements, but I think Margaret has a short temple talk she wants to give. Our noisy offering for the month of April is the Give Someone a Chance shower van. And the um, Give Someone a Chance is a local nonprofit organization that was formed to bring dignity to individuals in need and to improve the lives of people who are homeless or marginalized. And I wanted to read that because that's their written statement of their purpose. They provide some case management to help people find out what they need and help them get referred to other places. They don't intend to be a one-stop shop, but they work together with other organizations and programs that help people. But they realized one of the barriers to people getting the help they need was to not be able to get clean. So they have a bus that's set up that it is, uh, has showers in it and they go to a couple of different locations every week so that people can come there and get showers. They, they provide the towels, the toiletries, and clean underwear for people. And then now, in the la within the last couple of years, they have, uh, I think it's just been a year that this has been in existence. They have a laundry vehicle. It has five uh, sets of five washers and dryers. And so it's at the same place so that people can come and wash their clothing. And when you think about what this does for dignity and self-respect, uh, it gives people more self-confidence when they are going to seek health care, to uh, maybe apply for a job program or a, a, some other service that they might need. They come in with more confidence, and they're certainly greeted in a different way when they're clean and have clean clothes on. So just one, this one little piece, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's one piece that can work together with other things um, to help people be more successful and like their stated purpose to live with dignity and have some self-respect. And, and it improves their mental and physical health to just be able to be clean and have clean clothes. Two pretty simple things that I certainly take for granted in, in my own life. So that's our noisy offering for this month. Thanks. Thank you, Margaret. Other announcements. During April, May, probably even June, Pastor Jim will be leading a study in Genesis. This group meets Fridays from 10.30 to 12 at the home of Gordon Cavanaugh in Jamestown. And please uh, come if you like. Um, we're, we're getting quite a crowd and we're all really thrilled. 
Um, our presiding, uh, pres presiding pastor today has been Pastor Jim, and next week it is Bob. by Pastor Bob. Uh, noise, okay, we already know about the shower van. Uh, there will be a quick congregational meeting right after the service on April 21st that we have to vote on something. And the annual cleanup day with the Boy Scouts, this is on April 27th, and we need volunteers to help with cleanup and to help cook and serve lunch, and I think you either get a hold of Mike or Sandy. Thank you. Uh, other announcements? Our, t our leader today was Pastor Jim. Assistant Tiger, our reader was Mike Bonet. Altar Guild is Sharon and Sandy. Choir director is Clyde. Accompanist is Brian. Our tech team is Mike and Nancy. And our projectionist is Sandy. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the closing hymn, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. <laughs>